The war in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas has now roared past six month mark and is heading into the second half year of operations. It shows no sign of abating anytime soon. In fact, there is uh, the Israeli side appears to be set up for a major operation into the southern part of the Strip, into the Rafa area, uh, which has all kinds of potentials to go sideways and, and spike in uh, casualties. It's causing a lot of friction between the United States and, and, and Israel itself. There's also looming a potential Iranian response to their embassy being destroyed. And what may happen after that is anybody's guess, but it's probably not good. We'll actually be talking in more detail of that toward the end of this segment. But first of all, I want to take a step back and really for, for all of our viewers to really put all of this in context to understand how we got to this point. If we're ever going to be able to get out of here, it's crucial to understand all the dynamics and the influences and the power and the human dynamics that went into creating this situation so that you can understand what may be a path out. And uh, we have a guy who literally wrote the book on this, uh, one of our new favorites, Colonel Jacques Beau. Uh, and, and, uh, you can, we've seen it before. It's, it's right there over your shoulder. You've, you've recently published a book just a month or so ago, I guess, right? Uh, yes, the Al-Aqsa storm, yeah. uh, yeah. Al-Aqsa flood, sorry, the Al-Aqsa flood. And, uh, you, you talk about in there a lot about what happened on October 7th, but you also talk about some of the things leading up to that point, which were instrumental in that both on the Israeli and Hamas side. And so we're really eager to just jump into that. So um, let's just get right into it. So first of all, uh, tell us a little bit about what prompted you to write the book and and what things you discovered uh, in the process of doing it that it led to it in the first place. Well, in fact, when when this uh, this issue erupted on the 7th of October, first of all, I started the book before that. In fact, I started the book a few weeks before the 7th of October because I felt that something was boiling there and that we had we had to expect a problem and i started just a few weeks before the, the 7th of october but <clears throat> the interesting thing is that by writing a book you you have to dig into things and i uh, i i went through history and uh, definitely what i discovered was even beyond what i expected in fact because it showed that we have a very poor understanding of the whole conflict. To be honest, I, um, I, I was, uh, I, during my work in intelligence, I've been in touch and I have several friends, Israeli friends working in Israeli intelligence. I had uh, quite extensive contact with them and always good contact with them. And I never realized that, in fact, the situation of Israel is very different from the, from the one we, we tend to understand in the, in, in the West. And that's this book allowed me to go deeper into history, and I I really advise people not just because I'm the author, but because it explains a lot of things that we we have no idea, and that's that's a reason probably I would like to to go through a little bit of history today, to understand how the the reality in this conflict is misrepresented in in our in our media. Terrific. And if you allow me, I would I would start at the very beginning of the of the history, in fact, which is in fact Resolution One One Eight One, which was adopted on the 29th of November, nineteen forty seven, and this is the UN resolution that allows to partition the existing state of Palestine into two different states. Because that's something we, we always tend to forget. And, and before writing this book, I always forgot that. That, in fact, you had a state of Palestine between 1921 and 19, uh, 1948, in fact. And um, ben so, so RJ, actually on that point, because that's, that's a point of, of uh, potential misinformation, I guess, because I, I have heard many commentators in Western media say that actually there was no Palestinian state. It was just people living out in this area, which no, no. may not matter that much. But you're saying there actually was a Palestinian state of some degree? It was. You can even find videos on the uh, on the YouTube where Golda Meir, the, one of the first leaders of the uh, Israeli state, she said, I had a Palestinian passport. I was Palestinian. So during the, the, these, these 27 years, 
which were under the mandate of the British. The British had the, the received from the um, League of Nations a mandate to manage the, the, this, this territory, the administration, in fact, of this territory after the, the, the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Mm. But the territory had, had was an, a political entity. And you had people had a Palestinian passport, so the state of Palestine did exist. You even had a, 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 a Palestinian Olympic Committee, in fact. Oh wow! So, yeah, it, it was it was a full a, a state. It, well, it it, it had a, a, some institutions that were managed by the British, but it was a state. And the 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 UN resolution one uh, one eight one had in mind to offer the opportunity to have a Jewish state as well within this territory. And it's important also because media tend to say that the Israel was created by the United Nations. That's wrong. The United Nations offered the opportunity to partition Palestine into two countries. And that's the this uh, the, the the this map as we 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 know, which is widely uh, presented, that that um, you have this uh, this state of of Palestine here. This is the whole surface here, and on that you have you have a, a proposed Israeli territory here, and a proposed Palestinian territory. Here in in green, Opla, sorry. And <clears throat> the interesting thing is that in this resolution, it was said because the United Na the United Nations don't have the power to give territory. They don't have the power to take territory from someone and to give it to some to someone else. Therefore, the resolution provided for having referendum to make the population decide by itself whether or not it wanted to partition the country. And in fact, you had two visions at this, at this point in, uh, in Palestine. You had the Arab population, they wanted to keep the existing state of Palestine, and you had the Jews who wanted to have their own territory because... Oh, no, no, let me ask they, you, you know that when this 181 was was devised, the, the map you're showing right there, what... Yeah. It, it obviously wasn't going to be ethnic breakdown because there... Or, or was it? Was there already by 1947 uh, a, a, a many Jews living in those those areas that were, uh, were, I guess, brown or whatever that color is? I can't tell. Well, they were already there, and that's why they chose because it's obviously a very odd shaped uh, dynamic for both. And then, of course, there's no contiguous area for the Arabs. So I'm just wondering how they even found formed that in the first place. Well, in fact, you know, you're right to ask the question because uh, the Arab population felt that, but that's a proposal, by the way. It has never been set as the solution. It was a proposal. I don't know exactly. I mean, there were probably interests. Uh, uh, from the, the the Israeli population, and you know the, the Israeli population. Oh, sorry, the Israeli population is uh, was very active. I mean, had uh, already some lobbies in the West, and that's probably the reason why this this uh, uh, partition was designed. And and it was really unfair in in some, and it, it was even so unfair because the population, the Jewish population, in fact, was only 32% of the population at that time, and the Arabs had 68. So two third Arabic uh, Arabs and one third Jews. And that's also the reason why, as uh, although the, the resolution provided for having those re referendum, that the, the, the Jews never wanted to have this referendum, because if you see the population, in fact, you would say that any referendum would certainly be uh, uh, yeah. in favor of the Arabs. So and that's the reason why from November 1947 up to uh, May 1948, when uh, the Israeli declared independence, you had in fact um, you had in fact a struggle. The the uh, Jew, Jewish um, militias took 
the territory by force. And that's the reason why in as they declared independence, the Arab states said, no, 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 that's not possible because this is not what the resolution asked for. They had me no referendum at all. Nobody was consulted. And in fact, the, the whole Israeli territory was taken by force period. And that that's, was not even, not in the spirit and not in the letter of the UN resolution. So the UN resolution has never been implemented. Not a single word of this resolution has been implemented. Okay, so now I, I want to ask a question. I want to ask you a question about uh, one of the more popular things that are discussed, uh, uh, certainly among the Palestinian people, is the Nakba. And, and, and I wonder if you can explain how that fits in to all the stuff you just showed on that map. How does that fit into to what happened, uh, I guess, after 1948? Well, in fact, all the people who used to live in this brown area, in fact, had to leave. And you even had in some areas you had you, you had uh, and, and in fact, more than this territory, because even in on the 14th May uh, 1948, as uh, independence was declared by Israel, they had taken more territory than just the, the brown territory that you have on the map. As a result, in fact, most of the Palestinians had to leave and they regrouped in areas such as Gaza today, for instance. Because Gaza was is uh, made up by, by refugees from the Nabka, the Nakba, I'm sorry, uh, uh, in, in, um, in 1948. So um, they, they they had to go. Some remained on the on their uh, on the spot, and some adjusted and probably they accepted the the this situation. Uh, others had to flee, and that's the the whole Nakba result of this non-respect of the uh, the international this uh, international UN resolution. And, 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 and I wonder if I could ask, uh, Colonel, in, in the interest of time here, because I, I don't want to get too bogged down on the minutia here, but uh, at what point did the, the uh, Gaza Strip get literally cordoned off so that it was uh, fenced in? And why did that not happen in the West Bank? Well, I, I will come later on that. The problem of the West Bank is that it's a complicated topic because, in fact, the West Bank was part of Jordan, or Transjordan, so to say, uh, or, or not Jordan. And, in fact, the, the, the problem is that Jordan tried to protect and to keep in the 1948 war, Jordan tried to keep that territory for themselves. And the, the Gaza Strip, in fact, had been more or less agreed upon by the Israeli to push the, the refugees into. So it was already a refugee camp, if you want, already in 1948 at this stage. And later, Egypt, it was an Egyptian territory, by, by, uh, uh, by the way. So Egypt tolerated that. And you had you had more or less the same situation as the Israeli wants to do now by pushing people out of Rafa, exactly the same situation, and that's what you 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 had in 1948. So the the Israeli were literally pushed into that. Other refugees were pushed out of the Palestine territory. You had these these refugees in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan, in Egypt, and that prompted the creation of the UNRWA the UN Agency for the Refugees, that was, uh, UNHCR didn't exist at that point, and the, the uh, UNRWA, which was in the, in, in the middle of a, of a, of a, a controversy uh, a few months ago, yeah. right, um, right. the, the UNRWA was specifically created for the Israelis, for the um, Palestinian refugees, in fact, because there was no international institution to, uh, to to help these, these refugees. And <clears throat> that's exactly the situation that we had in 1948. But interestingly, it's interesting to see that, as you see, the, 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 um, the resolution from the 29th of November, but one day before, the CIA wrote a report for President Truman, a national intelligence estimate, and it's it advised President Truman not to accept the, this plan, this partition plan, and it explained 
why. And th this is a very interesting document, by the way, because it showed that the analysts of the CIA at that time were brilliant, literally. And I, I just read it for the people who cannot uh, uh, read. In the long run, no Zionists in Palestine will be satisfied with the territorial arrangement of the partition settlement. Even the more conservative Zionists will hope to obtain the whole of the Negev, Western Galilee, the city of Jerusalem, and eventually all of Palestine. The extremists demand not only all Palestine, but Transjordan as well. They will probably undertake aggressive action to achieve these ends. In the chaos which will follow the implementation of the partition, atrocities will undoubtedly be committed by Arab fanatics. Such action will be given wide publicity and will even be exaggerated by the Jewish propaganda. The Arabs will be accused of aggression, whatever the actual, the actual circumstances may be. Holy it's interesting crap. because oh man, yeah, it, it's interesting because you could almost take every word of that of that paragraph uh, for today for to describe today's um, uh, uh, today's uh, uh, situation. So you you see that the even the CIA was not so keen to have this partition plan because it was it was doomed to fail to some extent. Yeah, and, I mean, it was, and, that failure was baked in for, for very, for all the reasons I just mentioned there. Do you, do you know, have, have, did your history rec uh, uncover why the president of the United States decided to uh, ignore that advice and, and did in fact recognize Israel's independence? Well, there, there are different, there are different uh, um, uh, um, assessment on that because um of course the the, the role of Jew, the jewish lobby was was apparently quite significant in the us at the time uh, and and also in uk and uk was the mandatory uh, power in in palestine so probably that that comes from there but there was also a, an important aspect that we shouldn't forget is that um we were just out of the Second World War, yeah. and nothing to we 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 don't want to go deeper into that because it's it's uh, self-explanatory and 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 uh, obvious that the atrocities that were committed against the Jews during World War II were instrumental to make people understand that they needed their own territory. The problem was not so much to give them a territory. The problem was how this territory should be in fact divided and provided to the Jews. Right. And the, the this is interesting because the Arabs at that time had in mind to have a Palestine state that would in, integrate both populations. So it was not designed to be a, a fully Arab Palestine. They accepted to have a, a, a Jewish community and Jewish communities within this territory. The problem is that the Jews wanted their own territory. And that's, that makes the big difference. That's the reason why CIA uh, uh, noticed that. And we, are, we will come back on this issue of the Zionists and the, and the border issue, because it affects the situation still today. It is important to understand that the, 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 the borders of Israel, in fact, have never been really solved since 1948. And we have to remember that the, 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 the power uh, or the individuals that sponsored the territory or, or, or let's say sponsored the independence of Israel came out of a, a, a terrorist movement. I mean, it was considered as terrorist by the British, which was the Irgun. So the, it was a clandestine army. Now, look at the map which is on this insignia, and you see that this map is not very similar to the state of Israel. It goes a little bit beyond that. And in fact, it takes all the whole of Transjordan. And <clears throat> this has become a standing issue with the, with the, the Israeli um, leadership. They never wanted to define the borders, and we'll come into detail into that, because they, they contemplate the idea of having uh, this the, the, the other part of Palestine, because what you see here outlined in white is, in fact, the mandatory Palestine that were under the British. 
The problem is that in the in the early 20s, the British gave the this eastern part of Palestine, they gave it to the Jordanian or to the, the Jordanian monarchy because they were expelled from Saudi Arabia and they wanted to solve this issue. And for that reason, in fact, what was left for the, the Israeli or the future Israeli and the Palestinian was just the eastern part, the western part of the mandatory Palestine. And if we go today, well, today we have this border. We we'll come to this border uh, uh, because this, the border we have here is in fact an accepted border. Israel, since 1948, never defined its borders. And the idea was that they still contemplate the idea of having uh, the Eretz Israel, which is the big Israel, which to, for, for most uh, observers today is what is outlined in white here, which is the current state of Israel plus the uh, Palestinian occupied territories and the Golan. That's what most, uh, 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 let's say, observers today want. But there is still this idea of having the, although the territory that extends to Jordan, and you have even extreme ultra-Orthodox uh, uh, Jews who um, have yeah, I... in mind to have this Eretz Israel extending to Iraq and to Turkey and to Egypt. Basically, it's the, the, the places where the, the Jews historically, in the Bible, in fact, this is the, the, the Bible. Yeah, that's during the Solomon time right there, right? Say again? That's during the this, this Solomon reign, what's in the sea, right? Yes. So this is, this is, uh, this is the, the, the whole uh, problem of this. Uh, the, the, the Israelis still have this in mind, and therefore they never defined their, their borders. And what we had, so that was the territory that was proposed for partition in 1948. But after the war, in 1948, you had this border. This is, I, I, I outlined it in green because it's also known internationally as the green line. But in fact, it has never been an official border. This is the accepted or let's say tolerated uh, border of Israel today, but it has no legal basis. In fact, uh, Israel has taken the territory and in, in reality, there is absolutely no basis for the the existence of Israel is legitimate because it was it was legitimate for the Israeli to have a territory, but this territory is not legal. And that's interesting. It's a de facto border and not a de jure border. And that's in, important because we have seen the various scenario that are being contemplated by the, the right-wing extremists. And by the way, the Likud is derived from the uh, Irgun, uh, so the Likud of Benjamin Netanyahu. So he is exactly in that line. And the, the, the problem is for the Palestinians today is that they cannot recognize Israel because Israel has not defined its border. So you cannot recognize a, a state that has no recognized borders because do you then you run into the risk of recognizing a state that may claim your own territory. And that's exactly the problem we have today with the Palestinian resistance. And after uh, the Oslo agreement, where it was agreed upon by the two parties, the, the Palestinian, I mean, the uh, Fatah of, of Yasser Arafat in 1999, uh, 93, and uh, the Israeli government, that both uh, states would recognize each other. The Palestinians have recognized uh, the, the Israeli, but the Israeli never recognized the Palestinian state. As a result, they have a kind of a blank check. And they, this is the, the problem Palestinian. And that's the reason why the Hamas, for instance, didn't accept the Oslo agreement, because they said, well, why should we uh, uh, recognize Israel as long as they haven't defined any territory? 
And that's so it's ironic that's the, that you have both you have both Netanyahu and some of the Palestinians saying we don't recognize Oslo, especially after October 7th. I, I know that uh, Netanyahu many times said, yeah, Oslo is destroyed. We'll never go back to it, uh, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> Colonel, in the interest of time, I want to because I, I don't want to get away from yep. uh, the time we have here, especially to talk about where things go next. Um, you mentioned just before we came on air that a lot of the, the things that happened uh, in um uh, on October 7th, actually were started to really reach a boiling point before that. And I remember even during the summer paying attention to that before all this happened, that there was huge protest. There was, I think, somewhere around 200 Palestinians that were killed by Israeli uh, either settlers or, or the, the security forces. Uh, lots of anger that was boiling up. And so what actually happened on October 7th couldn't have been a surprise to too many people. But I wonder if you can kind of start from there. Uh, about what you saw during the summer that caused you to even start writing this book, and then what happened actually to October seventh? Well, in fact, you had you had a, 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 a conjunction of events that happened uh, since the late twenty twenty two and in twenty twenty three. First of all, you had um, you had ongoing negotiations for the for the release. Of um, of prisoner, uh, the Israeli have about five thousand Palestinian prisoners, uh, among which you have about one thousand, more than one thousand, about thirteen hundred, that haven't have been um, uh, in prison without any charge, and the, the there were discussions in the late twenty twenty two to have uh, through Qatar. To have the release, to to negotiate the release of those of those prisoners, and in uh, in in the late 2022, the Israeli government decided to stop this negotiation. And that was one of the first element. Another mm. element that came also at the same time, and in fact happened all uh, during the whole 2023, is the problem of the. Haram al Sharif. Haram al Sharif, or the Temple Mount, is the place where you have the Mosque of Al Aqsa. Now, what we have to to, to understand is that there is a project, and the, uh, an ultra orthodox project that have, has been started a few uh, years ago, that aims at building the third Temple of Solomon, and the construction of this temple requires the destruction of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And the, 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 the Al-Aqsa Mosque is on the uh, Mount uh, Temple Mount, which uh, uh, official name is Haram al-Sharif because it's an Arabic place, according to UNESCO. So it's not just uh, my, my decision, it's the UN decision. And the, this uh, uh, mosque, uh, this place, the Haram al-Sharif, is the third holy a place of Islam. And that means that destroying this mosque would be a catastrophe for the whole Islam. And you had many uh, riots on the Temple Mount in the, in the, during 2023 be, between ultra-Orthodox and Palestinians in order to solve or trying to, to find a solution to this, to this problem. And that's the reason, by the way, why this operation is called uh, Operation Flood of Al-Aqsa. Al-Aqsa is the name of the mosque on the Temple Mount, and that's that's the reason for it. So it the problem is has not been mentioned in our media, but it should not be underestimated because that's probably the reason why Saudi Arabia to, today has problem joining this so-called Abraham Agreement and all that uh, with with Israel because of that precise point. Then you had another problem, and we will discuss that when we talk about the organization of, of Hamas, that you have in the, in the Gaza Strip, you have Hamas rules the place, and it has not just a military, a, a military force there. It has also a, a complete administration with welfare services and social services, uh, provide school and all that, so it's, it's like a state. And these, all the, 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 the people, these, uh, the civil servants, if you want, uh, of, uh, the, on the Gaza Strip were paid by the Qatar. 
And for some reason, and to be frank with you, I have no idea why this was stopped, uh, mm -hmm. but the Qatar stopped to pay the wages of those uh, of those uh, um, civil servants. And that created a lot of troubles. And for and when, was that? when did they stop paying them? That was in July. That was in May, July last year. And ah. then at that point, you had you had the Israeli army, the Israeli military intelligence, who said that this is this starts to be the boiling point, and we from that point we we may have a big problem. And in fact, this the problem was anticipated by the Israeli intelligence because they noticed that there was a conjunction of issue that were uh, coming all at the same time, and these were and in addition to that what you had in, in the West Bank was the extension of the settlements. And the new government or the government of Netanyahu, which is right wing, as you know, um, is uh, in fact has declared that the, the settlements in the West Bank are declared as national value. As a result, there is no way they will back down or back uh, go back this will continue, and in fact, it has continued, and it had led to several uh, clashes between Palestinians and uh, the Israeli forces. And for that reason, by the way, on the 7th of October, you had forces that were basically dedicated to the monitoring and the surveillance of the Gaza Strip, who had been sent to the West Bank because of the rising tension on, on, the, on the area. And that's why, in fact, that's probably the reason why the Hamas decided to attack on the 7th of October, because they were probably less uh, military presence. I, I, I don't know if it was a coincidence. So, so I'm curious, or... if, if the Israeli, whether it was the, the Shin Bet or, or Mossad or just whatever, any other kind of military folks, if they recognized in the summer that things were reaching to a boiling point, especially after uh, Qatar stopped uh, the payments and that, that caused a lot of internal strife, how could they have been so shocked on October 7th? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, the problem is that probably they felt that the situation in the West Bank was uh, probably more dangerous than the one in the Gaza Strip. And wow. the, the, in, in fact, you have to realize that in the West Bank, uh, the, the settlers and the Israeli forces are in, in, touch, in, in contact with, with the, the Palestinians. While on the Gaza Strip, you have this fence and you had kind of a buffer zone if you want. So yeah. probably that's the reason why they considered that the situation in the West Bank was probably more dangerous. And for that reason, they had to deploy more, more troops there. In addition to that, uh, the West Bank is a huge area, while the, the, the Gaza Strip is a rather small area, which is probably easier to control. So that's probably the situation that led to the 7th of October. Now, an important thing is that we have also to remember that the Israeli resist, the Palestinian resistance is fully legitimate. And I think it's important because people tend to forget that. And that's the, the uh, General Assembly Resolution 451130 that reaffirms the legitimacy of the, um, the resistance in, in Israel, in Palestine, and they are even uh, allowed to use every uh, all available means, including armed struggle. So the, 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 Israel, the, the Palestinian resistance is, in fact, totally legitimate uh, based on the international law. And that's for the reason we have this defined before, or view before, uh, that the, the whole occupation of Israel, first of all, but also of the so-called occupied territories, I mean, the, the territories that have been occupied after um, uh, June 1968, uh, 67, all these territories are illegally occupied by Israel. And for that reason, the, the Israeli, the, the Palestinian resistance is fully legitimate. And this is, this is important because they, we come then into the creation of the Hamas. And I, I wanted to, to explain that because everybody sees the Hamas as a terrorist movement, which undoubtedly 
um, the Hamas used to be a terrorist movement, and it was created in 1987, and its covenant on the 1988, that is the, the, the piece of paper you have in front of you, in fact was extremely harsh against Israel and even asked for the destruction of Israel and all that. And in fact, when we mention the Hamas in the media today, we still refer to that document. But that's, that's a lie. Because in, in reality, in, uh, since the Hamas took, the, the, well, was elected, in fact, in 2006 in, uh, in the Gaza Strip, they started to take uh, seriously their political, the political dimension of the movement, and they adopted another charter, um, <clears throat> which has been published in uh, 2017, which is totally different from the, the previous one. It doesn't ask for the destruction of Israel anymore. It, uh, <clears throat> it, it still asks for a, a one country solution, but it's absolutely not against the Jews, and it is explicitly not against the Jews. So when you have in the media that the Hamas want to destroy all the Jews and all that, it's totally wrong. It's explicitly not so in the document. And in fact, there is also no indication that the Hamas has another a policy than the one which is described in this document, by the way. Yeah, so let let me ask you something, Colonel, because uh, uh, I know that, well, first of all, I wanted to ask you a little clarification on something you just said a second ago about, you said the Hamas used to be terrorist organization, implying that yeah. they were not. Now, I'm guessing that you mean like earlier in their formation, then for a period of right. time they weren't, and obviously they turned started to be on October 7th. But I remember yeah. distinctly, uh, and I wonder if you can discuss the dis disparity between yeah. the document and, and what was said. Uh, and I can't remember if it was Sinwar or one of the other leaders shortly after October 7th uh, was point blank asked in, in one of, I think it was Al Jazeera. They said, do you still advocate for the destruction of Israel? And he said, absolutely. There's, they have no place. There's, they, we still want them destroyed. And I don't know if that was because of what happened on uh, with what the Israelis had done when they went in and started attacking in the Gaza Strip, or if he was referring back to the original document, I wonder if you could talk about some of that disparity. Well, in fact, we have to, we have to be to be very very prudent here. Um, when I say that uh, Hamas used to be terrorist, it, it, it it used to be terrorist because it used to do terrorist attacks, so bombings and things like that, which are basically. Uh, a terrorist and that's in, in the 1980s in I guess you're talking about yes exactly the late 80s up to the early 20, uh, 2000s I would say so this is this is absolutely uh, this is absolutely clear the thing is that they changed their policy because they realized as did Yasser Arafat by the way in the 70s that using terrorists well, a terroristic uh, or terroristic approach was not um, was not the best solution uh, in in uh, to have international support, especially because after the 9/11 in the U.S., um, you had in fact the, the struggle against Islamists started to be everywhere in the whole world, and even the the, the Israeli government at that point said, "Okay, so the U.S. have Al Qaeda, we also have." Al Qaeda, this is the Hamas, and all that. And as a result, uh, the, uh, uh, the the Hamas tried to to make to distance itself from the Al Qaeda. And in, in reality, the Hamas is a purely Palestinian resistance movement. It has never, never waged any attack outside of the let's say the territory of Palestine, if you want, and it has never uh, attacked any other power. Uh, outside Israel, and <clears throat> this is this is the the reason why uh, uh, the Hamas slightly changed its policy to have a more let's say politically correct position. It's still a resistance movement. It's still fighting against a, an occupation uh, uh, power, which is Israel, basically, and. And so it, they are. They 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 feel at war against Israel. So we have to understand that because it's it's exactly the same thing as the Iraqi as the U.S. was in Iraq. 
or, or, the, or the, 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 the Afghan, as, as the, the NATO and others were in Afghanistan. They feel at war against, against them. And that's exactly what the, um, the Palestinians feel. So they, therefore, we have to be very careful about what they say. Yes, of course, when you are against an enemy, you want to destroy your enemy. That's, that's normal. But it doesn't mean basically that's what you... you, you it's, it's not your policy. It's something you may be uh, uh, pushed to or towards. So, so but do, do you hold that? Did, did October 7th change that? Because obviously when they went in there uh, into Israel and, and killed, especially the civilians, I mean, if they had just gone after military targets, it might be somewhat of a different conversation perhaps. But because they killed so many civilians, doesn't that almost by definition make them a terrorist organization again? Well, again, this is the problem here, and that's why I, I don't like to use this word terrorist because it's so politically uh, uh, loaded. Um, remember that only the Western countries consider the Hamas as terrorist. The rest of the world doesn't. Uh, it, it's a, it's an important point, by by the way. Um, if I'm not wrong, the UN never declared the Hamas as terrorist organization, for instance. So. This is, and, and, and by the way, this is the same thing as the Taliban in, in Afghanistan. They were not declared as terrorists by the U, even by the U.S., in fact, because they wanted to keep a way to, the, the Taliban yeah. in Pakistan were considered as terrorists, but not the Taliban in Afghanistan. So it's, it's, uh, it, we, we have to be very careful with the use of these, these, uh, these words. And in addition to that, to uh, answer your question, uh, we will talk about what happened on the 7th of October, but I think personally that before we make a judgment on the 7th of, of October, we need first to have a, an assessment or a, let's say a probe by the international community, an independent, objective and, and, and uh, um, impartial uh, probe into what happened on the 7th of October, because you will see that the things are not as clear as you may think. Um, the reality of the um, of what happened, uh, we see those guys uh, um, uh, uh, fighting. We 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 see them uh, firing their arms. We see them, but beyond that, uh, that doesn't explain the whole uh, aspect of what happened on that very day but i will come on this uh, uh later if you if you don't mind but i just wanted to say that the the hamas in in my view we should be careful by using the word terrorist because by by qualifying them as terrorists we then we exclude every possibility to negotiate and you know even the british uh, um I, I used to be in uh, uh, trained in in uh, in British intelligence in the in the eighties, and that was during the um, the the war in Northern Ireland, and and even the, the the British, in fact, at one point they had to negotiate with the terrorists. So we we need to be very careful by using these words and saying, well, we don't talk to terrorists. This right. Is so and, and that that actually is the case right now because you have at least at the government level in the United States, but uh, absolutely authoritatively in Israel, they have. And you see, it's an actually a stated objective of yeah, of uh, Netanyahu, the complete and utter eradication of Hamas. So the the question is going to be, even if if uh, um, Netanyahu succeeds. And by whatever means that he even he comes up with in his mind that they destroy Hamas. I don't know how you physically do that. But then at some point, some entity still has to exist with which you negotiate or govern even in, in the Gaza Strip. And I, I think that's one of the bigger issues coming well, out of we'll, this. We'll talk about, about this later because, as we see, we always talk about the Hamas. But in reality, what happened on the 7th of October is the product of several movements and not just the Hamas. The Hamas being the most important, but it's, it's, uh, it's also something that was waged. And still, by the way, what happens on the ground right now is not just the Hamas fighting Israeli forces. You have several other movements and we'll go into, into this uh, 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 later. So, uh, and, and we can go into probably into the structure of the Hamas. If, um, if you want, I will, I will go back to this, um, um, to do what happened on the 7th of October. I wanted to go on the 
on the fundamentals before. And yeah, if we could, I just, I, just, I don't want to run out of time. Uh, we, we, we're coming up on the hour. So I want to make sure we don't miss what happened, actually happened on yeah. October 7th. So if you could maybe catch that part. So I, I, I let this, uh, this, uh, the, the movie finish and we can go into the, 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 the structure. And then that's the structure of the Hamas. And that's important. I don't want to go into every detail of that. But the important thing here is to understand that there is a military wing and a civilian wing. And the military wing is in essence, well, you have a security service here, and you have the the so the the uh, is Adin al Qassam brigades or Katayeb, uh, which is basically the essence of the military force. All that is about between thirty to forty thousand individuals here, and the civilian part that's the part that in fact manages the 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 the, the Gaza Strip and does uh, provide social services, relief uh, for, um, for instance, uh, uh, hospitals and things like this. This part here, and that's the, the part that was not paid by uh, Qatar during the, the summer last year, is about 50,000 individuals. The, this, the civilian part is bigger than the military part. The, the, the other aspect that we have to understand is when you had in uh, late January, last year, or February last year, when <clears throat> the, um, the, the Israeli claimed that the UN agency in charge of the refugees in the Gaza Strip was in fact working with the terrorist organization. Um, in fact, they were talking about the civilian part of the, um, this, the, the, um, uh, that's the civilian part of the Hamas. The problem is that the Israeli government takes the whole organization as terrorists. They don't make the distinction between the military part and the civilian right. part. And for that reason, in fact, this is a this is this is a, just a, a, a political trick, if you want. But let me go further into the military organization. And when we talk about, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. When we talk about the, the military organization, as I said, what, what happened on the 7th of October is not just the, the Hamas that, that worked. In fact, it's an organization that is called the, uh, the, the Joint Opera uh, Operation Room, which is uh, this, uh, this organization here, that, that is, in fact, a coalition of all these movements that are in the Gaza Strip. You have, of course, you have the, the Hamas, but you also have the Islamic uh, Jihad, and you have other than the FPLP and even the, the Fatah or some elements of the Fatah and so on. So you have uh, about 12 different militias that are at, at work together and made this uh, 14th uh, does the this um, uh, seven of, of October attack? Now, probably before we have the consequence, it's interesting to see how this attack unfolded, and we can we can go here. I have a a, a small uh, video that it's a propaganda movie from the um, uh, the, uh, the the Hamas, and it shows how this uh, attack unfolded. Hmm. So it explains that the first step uh, of this attack was in fact to attack all the observation posts that were along the fence of the Gaza Strip and all the intelligence and, and, and the sensors were destroyed with drones dropping bombs on, on them. And that's, that's, they did that at the, uh, uh, simultaneously. Then you had the, the, these rocket launches that were designed to provide cover for the, the, uh, the paragliders that made the attack. The, the, the ones you have here on the screen, these paragliders were 
In fact, it's exactly like a military operation. You start this artillery fire to provide cover for people who go deep into the enemy to open kind of a bridgehead, if you want. And you had these guys here. And you had, at the same time, you had the first element of the uh, uh, land operation there. Now, <clears throat> how this land operation happened, they obviously forced their way uh, through the defense. Here they have the explosive frames that uh, could make a cut into the uh, defense and allowed so guys with bike and, and very mobile units to go through and to attack uh, the uh, to 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 go deep into the the territory of of, of Israel. You see over there that the, the the tower is has been disabled. You see the dome is is just destroyed. So that's how the, the whole thing started. Now, if we go on the map, we can see that the the idea of the Hamas was in fact to take prisoners in order to force the Israeli, uh, to force them back to the negotiation to, uh, the, uh, to, to the release of the prisoners. I told you that in uh, end of 2022, the Israeli broke the, uh, the negotiations and the idea of the Hamas was to take prisoners to resume to force Israel to resume the discussions. And basically they attacked about 25 military objects along this area, which is called the Gaza envelope, which is the area that is designed to create a kind of a buffer zone between the Gaza Strip and the territory of Israel. This is under the responsibility of the so-called Gaza division. The headquarter of this division is in in the, the base of the military base of Reim here. And this is important because in Reim you had at the same time that's where you had the music festival that was just uh, uh, just on, on the, the, the on, on the, the fence almost or the fence of the military base. Then you had other other targets, namely Urim, which was attacked by a small commander. Urim is the is the intelligence coordination center to uh, that coordinates all intelligence activities in the Gaza Strip, and from that place you have you have, for instance, the unit uh, uh, 8200, which is um, a signal uh, signals intelligence unit, which is based here and monitors all the communication in the Gaza Strip. You had the Eretz, um, this is a, a, a strategic crossing point here, and the naval base, or uh, yes, it was a naval base of Zikim, which was attacked by like the, the, the I would say, the, the seals of, of the Hamas. And they, 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 they fight there almost one week, at, actually. So that's the maximal line, line of advance of the of the uh, the Palestinians there, and that's that's what happened. Now, what happened in in the in in this place, especially in the Reim uh, area, this was in fact described by two uh, journalists of the magazine uh, Idiot Achonot. They have they made. Of a detailed account of what happened in these uh, on that day, and <clears throat> they explained that what happened on that day is in fact much uh, much more controversial as we may think, because in fact what they say is that the the uh, the Israeli command and control was totally taken by surprise. Why that? Because. The, the Palestinians managed to disrupt the whole intelligence uh, uh, capabilities of the of the Israelis. We have seen that they destroyed all the observation position observation posts in the um, in, in the uh, along the fence, if you want, and they also managed to disrupt all the communication. As a result, 
the Gaza division, which is in charge of monitoring the the whole uh, uh, Gaza Strip and the, the basically the Gaza envelope around the, the Gaza Strip, they were totally blind and they were not able to identify what was going on. They knew that it was an attack. They knew that uh, the Palestinians had forced their way into the, the, the fence, but they didn't know how much, how many people. They didn't know what was attacked. They didn't know the magnitude of the attack. And therefore, they had a completely, the, 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 the Israeli command came into panic. The command. So let, let me ask you this question at this point. So uh, it sounds like your assessment is that the initial intent was to hit military targets and to get civilian hostages for the purpose of negotiating going back here. But what went, what happened and broke down when obviously a number of people from this, the strip that escaped actually went after civilian people and just started killing large numbers of them. What, what broke down at that point? Well, then we'll, we'll come into that. We'll come into that. But before I just want to say something, the problem is that the, the, the Palestinians, they, their aim was to catch military prisoners to exchange because for them <coughs> according to them the military personnel has more value than the civilians to make some kind of of discussions with the with the israeli uh, uh, leadership so <clears throat> that was the idea now what happened is the music festival was not supposed to be there in fact the 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 festival was supposed to end on the on on the Friday night, the the Friday before, and it was extended because it was successful, and the, the organizers asked our authorization to extend the the, the this festival uh, to uh, Saturday morning, and that was granted. By the way, this is a, still a discussion because during the night before the attack. The Israeli intelligence noted unusual activities in the Gaza Strip, and they you had an emergency meeting at that was midnight before the attack with the military of the the, the Gaza division in order to identify what 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 can we expect. And they raised the emergency level, but they didn't extend the extension of this emergency level to the problem of the music festival. They didn't expect something in that of that magnitude. And that, the, that's the reason why, in fact, they didn't take action. And the, 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 the day after, as the Palestinian attacked, they were surprised to find the civilians. And in fact, we have even... Uh, 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 witnesses saying that the Palestinians were asking their way to the to the young guys who were in the festival. They were asking their way to the military base because, as I so I told you, the festival was just beneath the um, uh, the, yeah. the, 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 okay. the military base. Yeah. Yeah. And so this was this was another aspect is that, as I told you before. They, because the Israeli command had to take some soldiers from the Gaza area to uh, the, um, the, the the West Bank. In fact, the problem is that the the, the Palestinians didn't find the military they asked they, they were looking for, and in fact they entered even some kibbutz area and they asked the civilians to call the security forces. And they started to wait for the security forces with the civilians in order to take prisoners from the security forces. And that's interesting because that was, that was um, reported by Israeli journalists. So, and that tends to confirm that the, is, the, the Palestinians didn't want or didn't came to take civilians. And probably because they were forced to go back to the Gaza, the Gaza Strip, and they hadn't find found enough uh, 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 prisoners. If they want, they they took civilians instead. But that yeah. was and, probably and, and, not. And Colonel, I want to show just real quick, just to kind of to underscore the emotions of that day. Here is the uh, the description of one of those uh, people, civilians who was taken. Gary, roll that tape. <laughs> אנחנו עושים את ה... 
לא יודעת, שניים וחצי קילומטר האלה. ואני לא מרימה את הראש. אז אנחנו מגיעים לאיזושהי נקודה, אז אני עוד פעם מתרוממת. ובא מישהו וחוטף לי את הילדה מהידיים. את, את אמה. פשוט לוקח לי, אני במצב שבו היא הייתה עליי, הוא בא ולוקח לי, מושך לי את הילדה מהידיים. ובשלב הזה פתחתי את הפה, בשלב הזה ניסיתי לצעוק, ניסיתי, בינתי, בינתי, בינתי. זה לא עזר. לקח לי את הילדה, כיוון אליה רובה, סימן לי לשבת. אין לי מה לעשות. כי אם אני מתה פה, אז גם הבת שלי נשארת לבד, או מתה אחריי. אני, אני לא יכולתי לשמור על הילדה. אני לא יכולתי לשמור על הילדה. על ילדה בת שלוש ושלושה חודשים. So, Colonel, what, what do you say to some of the reports that came out probably within a month or so of, of, uh, of October 7th that says that whatever intent the Hamas military wing may have had, apparently once those, I think it was like 30 breaches or 20, whatever the number was, uh, that many of just regular Palestinian men took advantage of the opportunity and, and that literally went on a killing rampage. How, how do you see that part happening of the civilians? Uh, no, I mean, there's, I, I haven't seen any evidence of that, but that, that probably happened. That's probably happened, but I haven't seen any evidence of that. And in fact, what we have seen, and if we, if we look at what, um, what we have seen, because what happened after the, the initial attack and as the U.S., the, the Israeli command uh, could not figure out what was going on on the, on the, on the area, they sent combat helicopters, Apache helicopters, basically. And these guys, they saw a, 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 a confusion on the ground and they, were, they asked the command what to do. And since nobody was, knew what was going on, in fact, they gave the green light to open fire. And these guys started to open fire on, on almost anything. And we have, that comes from the Israeli uh, forces uh, um, uh, footage. And you see that you had a lot of people that are obviously not Hamas people. And these guys were all shot down by, shot by helicopters. Like this car. I mean, this car, this is the, 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 the footage just before it was exploded. But you see that this car had nothing to do with the, the kind of uh, pickup trucks that used to be um, uh, used by the Hamas. So basically, you, you had a total panic on the ground. You, I, I also have this, um, this testimony from um, this young uh, tank commander uh, who was sent in the kibbutz Beri. Uh, she's commander of a Merkava tank. I mean, basically, you had a, a, a squad of uh, a platoon of a Merkava tank who was sent over there. And she she was said, and as she says here on the on the on the, on the Israeli uh, TV, said she asked if if they were people on the on the, the building she was supposed to shoot at and she asked are the civilians there and people said well we don't care just shoot and that's exactly what what happened in fact during and that's the reason why most probably the Hamas did some war crimes during that day that's most probably true but probably not to the extent that we are seeing in the in the media. And the, the problem here is, uh, is not to say that they are good guys or bad guys. It's not the problem. The problem is that then the, the crimes or the alleged crimes of the 7th of October were then used to justify the bombing of the Gaza Strip. And that's, that's the issue because we, we took advantage or we tried to justify a crime with another one. And the, the, the magnitude of the first crime has not been demonstrated in any way. And that's, in fact, there are many people, and including those two uh, journalists uh, of uh, Edio Tachonot and, and several other journalists have, in, and there are more and more uh, uh, testimonies and, uh, uh, emerging in the Israeli press, suggesting that there were probably uh, uh, some wrongdoing from the Hamas, but not in the dimension we have seen or we uh, that are alleged uh, uh, to the um, for that for that day. So we have to be very, very careful here, especially when we try to use 
a narrative to justify another crime. And well, it does, it's, Colonel, and that, that, that kind of brings us really up back to where we are today because all the things that were that happened on October 7th were, uh, you know, if, if you say 1,200 Israelis were killed, both military and civilian, and it really doesn't matter by whom they were killed or what the message, because any kind of conflict gets messy then, but none of them should have happened. But then in lieu of that, or in result of that, 33,000 people in Palestine have been killed and their most of their ability to sustain life in the city has been wiped out. But now then here's where we are right now. And this is where I want to get your comment now, based on all of that stuff, all the history that led up to what started October 7th and where the people are now, what do you think is going to happen here? Because right now, as we speak, uh, there is apparently an operation that that Yahoo claimed that there's a date to start in Rafa. And at least up to this point, there's no plan to get those people out of there. So if they go in and attack, there's going to be another huge spike in civilian casualties. And here's what Netanyahu said. Uh, no, I'm sorry. First of all, this is what uh, the President Biden said uh, on the 10th. Uh, so yesterday in relationship, and this is why wow, this ties in so strong into this, after Israel attacked uh, or, or assassinated an, an Iranian general in the consulate building in Syria and destroyed that building, and as the world waits on what happens right now, Biden is basically saying no matter what is, uh, Iran does, uh, Israel has basically a, a free check to do whatever they want. Here's what he said. We also want to address the Iranian threat to launch a significant, they're threatening to launch a significant attack on Israel. As I told Prime Minister Netanyahu, our commitment to Israel's security against these threats from Iran and its proxies is ironclad. Let me say it again, ironclad. We're going to do all we can to protect Israel's security. And here's in response, actually, or actually the day before, I believe it does. Or no, this was today. Here's Netanyahu's response. Really, really telling there, I think, at the end that he specified and offensive, which which primarily would mean potentially and or Hezbollah in the north in Lebanon or against Iran. So how do you see this stuff playing out right now, given all the foregoing? Well, in fact, the, the, the problem of, of Israel is that uh, since the early 50s, in fact, <clears throat> and that happened uh, regularly since then, the Israeli tried to drag the U.S. into, into the area. And um, you're, there's a famous uh, Lavon, uh, Lavon affair in, in Egypt in the 50s. Then you had also, by the way, you, you may remember the bombing of the, Ameri the, the U.S. Marines in uh, Beirut in, uh, in October uh, 1989 that the Israeli had foreknowledge of, but they didn't, they didn't warn the Americans because they expected that the Americans would then enter the region and, and fight, in, uh, the, 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 uh, in, in fact, fight, the, the, the militias in Lebanon. So uh, this was reported by, by an Israeli former Mossad agent, uh, Viktor Ostrovsky, and he has wrote a book uh, about this, uh, this area. So the, the, this has been a constant effort of, of, the, of the Israeli. The problem is that Israel has always considered that its security would be better if its neighbors are at fight within between each other. And so that's why Israel has always tried to, in fact, it's a, it's a strategic idea of the chaos, using the chaos to preserve itself to some extent. So the people will spend their time fighting each other instead of being, um, of, of being uh, uh, attacked itself. And, <clears throat> This is uh, this is a little bit the strategy of of the um, of the Israeli. The problem is that today you have a very strong Hezbollah. Hezbollah has 
probably the strongest army in the in the Near East right now, and it's a it's it's not an offensive army. It's an army which is not designed for offensive uh, war, but for the defensive one. But it's a very strong, and it has uh, in the in the last months, Hezbollah has attacked significant. Uh, uh, Israeli installation in the, I mean, intelligence uh, structures in the, the Golan area and all that. And Israel, in fact, is sitting between two chairs because it cannot really react without going into full, uh, uh, full war with uh, with Hezbollah. And Hezbollah is very strong, so you can see what happens with the Hamas. Hamas, Hamas has not a very strong uh, army, but Within the, the Gaza Strip right now, in fact, Israeli didn't have any part of the Gaza Strip under control or the full control. The, the, the Hamas and the, its allies are, in fact, fully in control of the, of the Gaza Strip. It was, you have some Israeli troops there, but they are, they are permanently harassed by this. It's a guerrilla activity, by the way. So if the the Israeli would like to do the same in the, in South Lebanon, they would suffer probably even more casualties. And that's for yeah. the, the reason why, in fact, uh, Israel is really sitting between two chairs, whether it should react or not. And that's the reason why it, it would like to have the U.S. there, because it sees right. that now... It, it cannot. It cannot manage, uh, it, because in fact, right now um, Israel is fighting on three fronts, basically. I mean, military front. You have Gaza, definitely. You have the West Bank, and the tension in the West Bank has increased. I mean, increased regularly uh, since uh, last October, and and uh, there are some indications that it may erupt in something. More, uh, more violent now, and of course the northern front with the Hezbollah. I have to also to underline that uh, along the border with South Lebanon, the um, the Israeli have evacuated all the civilians. So there are something like hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand civilians who have been evacuated from the northern border because uh, there is a, the tension is, is so high. So Israel is a little bit at the limit of its capacities here. And that's the reason why it would be uh, uh, interesting for them to have a, a foreign presence and, and the US. Mm -hmm. The problem is that right now the US is, uh, you know better than me, that the US is now into a presidential election year. And with the with the problem in Ukraine and no solution in sight in Ukraine, um, there is not much appetite to go physically in in the Middle East. Uh, yeah, I, I think that the Biden administration wants to thread the needle of of sounding, you know, pro Israel, and we got your back to keep a lot of their voters happy, but not so far that they actually exactly. have to act on it. Uh, because exactly. a, a starting war in a presidential yeah. election is, uh, is it's a bad juju. It's not gonna not gonna help him out here. Uh, Absolutely. Colonel, I wonder if in, in the in the last few minutes that we have, uh, I wonder if you could uh, talk about uh, what you think Iran may do. Because we were talking before we went on the air that you have a different view than a lot of people that uh, they're not that you don't think Iran is going to do some big splashy thing, which I think many in Israel are hoping for, because that will justify doing something on the aftermath. But what do you expect out of the Iranians? No, I think, well, the Iranians have been very clear so far. They will not respond directly to the Israelis. Uh, I mean, with direct involvement, like uh, 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 shooting missiles or having some air, air attack or something like that. No, they probably use their proxies. Um, maybe they will provide more weapons to the Hezbollah. Or they may uh, use it also provide more weapons to the um, the Iraqi militias that are pro Iranians, and and you have several several militias. In we in fact, Arabia didn't mention that, but in reality, in the last couple of months, you had Iraqi, I mean, pro Iranian uh, militias in Iraq who have shot uh, missiles 
to towards Haifa, for instance, um, they have damaged seriously the oil reserves of of Israel in the area of the port of Haifa, uh, and they had they sent several cruise missiles even towards Israel. That, that's about 500 kilometers from from Iraq. So it shows that these these militias have some capabilities and capacities in order to create some problems to the Israelis. And that's probably what the, is, the, the Iranians will do. They will not go directly because there are so many people, even in the US, by the way, who are so impatient to have an opportunity to strike within and Iraq. Or, are. We've shown some on this channel. Itself. Exactly. So I think I think the Iranians are very uh, uh, aware of that, and they will not go directly with that. But they may provide uh, a few uh, additional weapons and create probably some incentives for and those militias. Do you do you that. think there's any chance that uh, Iran may say, you know what, we just have to have a weapon nuclear weapons program. We're going to push over that final edge and actually have a weapons program. Would they risk that? No, I don't think so. The Iranians, um, they had uh, the idea of having um, a weapon, a, a nuclear weapon project, and they started in the uh, short after the U.S. Uh, invaded Iraq in the, in 2003. They shortly contemplated the idea of having a nuclear a, a nuclear program, and then they studied the feasibility. And apparently, they they noted that it would create more problems than solutions, and they abandoned the idea. And since then, the Israeli claim that the Iranian have um, a nuclear weapons project, but in fact, even the UN agency that monitors the, I mean, the nuclear, uh, yeah. the uh, atomic agency. I don't know the acronym <clears throat> in English, but they they have never found any proof and evidence that the Iranians had a nuclear weapons program. They have capabilities to enrich uranium. They have the ability and probably they could enrich uh, uh, uranium to the, to the, the, the weaponization uh, level. So that's, that's uh, uh, definitely true. But there, there is apparently no willingness to do so. And in fact, why should they do this so? They have <clears throat> enough capabilities to act in uh, with other proxies and and people on the ground that may in fact support Iran in in such a situation. So I think the no, I don't see that personally. And we have also to say that the Iran has uh, extended its cooperation with with uh, Russia, with China, and <clears throat> both countries are probably not so keen supporting the idea of having oh, a nuclear, nuclear arm. Iran. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, listen, uh, Colonel, we are so grateful for your insights today and this uh, this great, uh, I, I know we could have gone another two or three hours and, and, and still not hit it all, uh, but we're grateful for your time and deepening our understanding on this very complicated issue. And we are definitely going to keep watching what happens in the coming even hours, possibly. And and definitely as the weeks pass by and more things keep happening here, we'll keep touching you for your expertise and explanations. Thank you. Thank you for having me on your show. Thank you very much. Always our pleasure. And thank you for joining us today. We're always grateful for uh, you folks who come out here and watch us every day. Don't forget, we have a great show for you this afternoon with John Mearsheimer. Uh, he's going to be talking about a, a claim by Vladimir Zelensky that he's going to have a new counteroffensive. Not sure what uh, that's all about, but we'll be we'll be checking that out. And then you will not want to miss John Mearsheimer uh, today. Uh, so join us when at that point. Be sure to like and subscribe and share this with your friends, because remember, we're all in this together. We remain, along with you, unintimidated and uncompromised. We'll see you this afternoon on Daniel Davis Deep Dive.